My Lords, I do not intend to dwell in this debate on the inanities of the spending by the GLC and, and uh, Livingston. Such wanton abuse of power is offensive to most ordinary, sensible people. Especially is it an affront to Londoners who pay rates. Perhaps the worst aspect of it all is the odium and the ridicule which these people have brought on the good name of local government as such. We only have to talk as I have done to local government leader. The debate about the abolition of the GLC is usually presented as a battle between the politicians. This programme looks at how the threatened abolition will affect people in two inner-city London boroughs, Lewisham and Greenwich. It's also about what the GLC has meant for some of us who live and work here. Now you've got to square this to there. When you've got this one square, then you've got to square that to there. So we knew as a staff okay. that there was a great deal of talent among the elderly. At that time, when we were talking about that as staff members, the, the premises either side of our office happened to come vacant. So we got our heads together and we thought up the idea of a skills centre where elderly people would be teaching young people skills that perhaps are no longer available or perhaps a skill that they particularly have got as they've worked at it all their life. Can we see the band? And that's quite nice. That fits quite nice. I was sort of, at the time, looking for something, you know, to take me out the house. And um, I saw the leaflet with the uh, age concern on it. And uh, when I read it, I, it quite appealed to me, you know, to do it. You can always mix with older people, but you don't always get the chance to mix with the younger people. Well, I was 29 years in West Africa, in the sawmills, putting trees down, peeling, slicing, making parquetry flooring, mosaic flooring, and I worked until I was 70. I was doing nothing until I found this place. You, you were lost. You, you, you you'd only, could only go for a walk to the park and back, uh, go around the shops, and that became the same old routine every day, every day, every day. It's no good. You're better to be doing something. Everything in the skills centre, the staffing, the heating, the lighting, the rent, everything is supported entirely by the GLC. There is no other source of funding. Certainly we wouldn't get more money from London Borough Lewisham at the moment. So we will try and get other funding, but as you can imagine, it's a large sum of money, be very difficult to raise. And if the GLC ceased tomorrow, the centre will stop. I know that even the, the, the luncheon clubs that have been formed, they were, they were likely to lose them, and that has brought people out to mix with people instead of sitting at home. They've also saved on their fuel bills when they've gone into these clubs and places during the day. They're not having to use their fuel at home, older people. And they've been, it's given them a lifeline, whereas they sit at home, who have they got to talk to the four walls? <laughs> It's the fact 
that I myself wanted to be independent anyway. Uh, we had, to, I had a tr some trouble at home, and uh, at the time I wasn't working. You know, so I'd been indoors most of the time. I decided I couldn't stay around, so I left. I think it was the same day or the next day, Stopover took me in. It was about two weeks after I actually had been at Stopover. They introduced me to Kevin and said that I'd be working with him. Uh, Stopover is a short stay hostel for homeless young people um, aged 16 to 21. <coughs> and the young people can stay at Stopover for about up to four weeks. Um, those that are going to go on to get their own independent accommodation usually are offered resettlement support and that's how I was introduced to Neville after he'd been there about a couple of weeks. Um, he didn't have anything definite coming up, but we had we had put his name down on the non-priority homeless scheme, which is how he got this, this flat. But it's one thing to get a flat, it's another thing to be able to actually live in it, and Neville had no savings and no furniture. And furniture grants take a long time to come through sometimes. He still hasn't come through after three months. So we, we get f furniture donated to Stopover, and We've got a couple of baby bellings that we, we buy out of some charitable money that we get given. And we lend those to people, and we lent, we've lent never one of those so that he can actually, even though it's not luxurious at the moment, he can actually, he's got somewhere to sleep and he's got something to cook on. And he's got a fridge and a, you know, some plates and stuff like that. Just basic amenities so he can actually live. Can you tell me first of all how you actually got to stop over? I got kicked out of my home by my dad and so I went to a housing aid uh, centre and they rang here and there was a vacancy so I came along. And where were you living before, before you came here? I was living in Kidbrook. In Kidbrook? Right. And why did you have to leave there? Just generally because me and my dad and his wife really didn't get on together. You say his wife, it wasn't your mother? It's not my mum, no. He's remarried now. Right. And there's no chance of you going back then, no? No, I don't think so. Yeah. From what the hostel workers have been telling me, you're keen to, to, to go for independent accommodation with friends, whatever. Then, once it gets nearer to the time of actually getting the flat, um, what do you think are the main areas you'd actually need help on from, from us? Once I got the flat? Yeah. Um, well, really, just a lot of things, really. I'd need... I can budget on that, I think. But we probably need help there. Before there was any resettlement work, um, there were people leaving Stopover, going, getting their own flats, and very often breaking down, getting into huge rent arrears, sometimes didn't even have the gas or electricity connected after they'd been there two or three months. Your relationship would be with your, with your father and stepmother once you'd actually got your own If place. the GLC is abolished, then that's, that's the end of resettlement work at Stopover. Hopefully, once things ease off a bit, hopefully me and my dad will be able to become friends again. Mm. And maybe live apart and be friends. I find it better with my family, you know, for after I've left, because we do actually, you know, miss each other and talk to each other. Well, if I was living at home then, because they'd be saying so much of me anyway, they wouldn't know how much they'd miss me, so. On a basic level, we're helping people to, to survive, really, on a very low income. Um, but I think there's, there's something more than that, because we're actually, where possible, we're trying to help a group of people who are really, a group of people who are under pressure to, to live a more positive and uh, a more creative life. LBC News. Angry tenants will lobby MPs today to see if the government will honour its pledge to carry out a massive renovation of council homes throughout London. Four years ago, the government transferred responsibility for the programme to the GLC. If the council is scrapped, the £1,000 million investment will hang in the balance. And already, boroughs have warned that they can't... Well, I've been living on Downham City with the GLC estate with Herbert Morrison and company. And that's a long while to be on the estate and have nothing done to your housing. I want the houses renovated properly. And I want them, when they're renovated, I want the people to come over and see the job done properly.
sod knows what will become of London town. We don't want to wait and see. Well, the main lobby is about the actual promise of this government to allow renovation programme to be carried out on all ex-GLC uh, properties. They've gone against the promise because they didn't take into account, with the abolition of the GLC, the amount of finance that would be necessary to maintain these properties and renovate these properties. And we're talking about properties sometimes uh, uh, 50 years old that uh, have never really had uh, proper modernisation. On Downham the problem is that uh, what was classed in 1925 as a, a facility that was uh, of a standard, in 1985 all it consists of, uh, the kitchen is, consists of a sink with a draining board and that is actually called a kitchen. Um, the bathrooms uh, just have got a bath and a toilet in them with no hand basins. Well, if the GLC is abolished, if the uh, funding which the government's promised is not forthcoming, I can foresee real uh, slum properties developing on down. And we're talking about an estate with 6,000 properties. And I mean, I'm only talking about one estate. Uh, there were 13,000 properties handed over to the Lewisham uh, Council uh, in 1983. It's encouraging for us as, as uh, tenants to see that if the council does provide us with um, some sort of space, we can do, um, we can make things such as this and improve our life on Silwood. GLC actually handed over to Lewisham in July '83, uh, eventually, um, but prior to that, for about a year, we've been discussing with the GLC what improvements we as tenants would like to see and that I think got a lot of people involved who otherwise might not have got interested in the problems on Silwood. What's happening there is there's um, the low rise masonette blocks there have got as part of their improvements um, they've got gardens at the front of the blocks and also gardens done up at the back. Having a garden front and back means there's an extra barrier to, uh, to break-ins. Well, there was four original phases in the improvement programme and the fourth stage is the one which uh, we're worried about because uh, of the fact that the government's going to cut the, uh, the money available for that. The last phase of the improvement programme uh, was planned for central heating in the high-rise blocks which suffer quite badly from condensation. Also environmental works Environmental is sort of a, an airy fairy term, but really to us it means uh, better roads. That includes drainage works as well. Um, and pavements for people to walk along. There's an awful lot of families on the estate that try and push their pushchairs along, you know, sort of rickety pavements, and it's, it's ridiculous. Um, the other main problem is parking as well. There's very little provision for parking. I think a lot of the places that were built for cars were built in areas that weren't... Um perhaps the best position for them and they've been um, quite open to, to vandalism because they're not really connected with the, uh, the flats that they serve. That's the same I think as well with the play, play areas, we've got some pl play facilities on the estate or communal sitting out areas for people um, and they're totally insufficient for, it, for the number of children that are now living on the estate. It was a start for us and it really got us going on the estate to think that this is what it, sort of improvements could be achieved. Uh, I mean, two, two years consultation, uh, you know, I just don't, don't see how that can all go down the drain now. I don't know who the government thinks will provide those things, um, because obviously the borough councils don't have the funds available um, due to other legislation by this government. And if you take the abolition of the GLC in conjunction with 
the um, fact that quite a number of the inner London boroughs are rate capped, I think that the financial disruption to inner London government in 1986 and onwards could actually be very severe. Um, let's take a specific example of grants to voluntary organisations. Now, if, like this council, you are spending almost at the limit of Section 137 discretionary expenditure, then I do not see how on earth we can take over our share of the GLC's contribution to voluntary organisations. There's nowhere we could, where we could actually fit it. Yes, this is exactly what um, she's trying to do. She's trying to bring back the, um, the old Victorian days. And um, what her idea, her idea is that all the pensioners and the disabled and the sick people should not, um, should not depend on people like the GLC to survive. They should be thrown back onto the community. But how can the community help when she's cutting back from the community? childcare figure in the whole of London, which means that they've got a huge waiting list for things like day nursery places. And although there were there were odd crashes, there was actually a need for women who lived on large estates and just wanted to pop along to training sessions or to meet together. And so like one of the ideas was to set up a crash that was mobile. You can't get the man in. Tangs out. In a minute. Yeah, can all have a go. We recognise there are a lot of women who are actually looking for childcare places. We probably can't provide crashes for women to be able to go to work. We can certainly provide crashes so that women can take an active part in their surroundings and in the activities that are going on. Hopefully, we can reach areas of the borough where childcare facilities are actually very small and limited um, and so the idea would be that where we were needed we would we would go with the equipment and the workers in the van to areas where they may not have any community crashes at the moment and we were particularly concerned that crash facilities should be actively anti-racist and anti-sexist and should provide for children with disabilities Dinner. Is it his dinner? What is he having then? At he eight. Is that having his tea? Yeah. yeah. It's also it's just important it's for women to just have a break. I mean, if there's like a local crash where they know they can leave their children for a couple of hours, just to actually leave them there and go back home, just to be on their own and relax. So it's, it's really important just just to sort of have time to do things for yourself. I mean, there's lots of fantastic things about being at home with your children, but it's really very frustrating and isolating to, um, uh, to feel that th that should be enough. I, mean, I couldn't stand doors with my little boy five days a week doing nothing. I mean, it's depressing. We went after funding from the local borough and through Urban Aid. But those resources are, 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 quite, are very stretched and like we would obviously prefer to be funded by our local council as a recognition of childcare in the borough. But failing that, we then, we then turned to the GLC and that's where we got the funding. The banner headline was, now it's babies against racism. And we felt that um, like it was a way of putting down what we were doing. And obviously it was quite a shock to a sort of a small group to find themselves in a paper where we thought it was quite an innocent activity going on. <laughs> and uh, that obviously they totally misunderstood everything we stood for. And that we, we did feel we were also a pawn being used by the media because they obviously don't like the women's committee. It's like all zooming on gay groups and women's groups and all these subversive things that the GLC are involved in. And people won't actually think about what's really happening to them. The article quoted a Tory councillor who said, um, how can two-year-olds be racist and sexist? 
which misses the point about all the, the images that children are fed about, like ideal families, like middle class, two, two parents, um, always white, you know. Any Janet and John books, like there, there isn't a black person in them. And, you know, if you live in a borough like Lewisham, then it's a multiracial borough. And I think it's important for white children also mm. that they see black doctors in books as well. And it makes them appreciate black people a bit better instead of looking down on us all the time. So I think that positive images are really important and I think it's high time a lot of other groups and societies and organisations accept that racism does exist and try to do something about it. I think if the GLC is abolished, there'd be no funding for minority groups. And I think it's important that minority groups do get funding because they pay the same amount of tax as everybody else. Teachers have a system which they, they, they put, they, they, they teach black children on a lower scale. They don't, they don't teach them the way they should teach white children. They are, they are taught on a lower scale. The black kids think that some of the white teachers are not interested in them. If they are interested in them, they're only interested in for the, 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 back, the fact that they're good at sports or things like that, not their academic qualifications. Well, a lot of the kids was coming home from school and they're backward in their spelling, in their reading, and their maths. They can't do their maths properly. They just can't tell you what they learn, and the parents never feel good about it. So we, the parents, come together and have a meeting, and we say we'd we'll like to have a, a Saturday school to help the kids. As a mother myself, I find that um, in schools, enough work has not been set for the children, enough aim has not been set, say, within the 8 to 10 um, age group. And to think that they go into school Monday to Friday, Obviously, I think a lot more can be done. So that's seven plus two plus eight. Seventeen. So what do I do? Adam, so what do I do? Put, put, put the seven in, in there and carry the one. Seven. And eight plus one. The GLC, first of all, it's helped this um, Saturday school particularly because whatever they give us, it all goes to help taking the children out on school, school well, Saturday school visits, journeys, places of interest. The GLC has given us the chance to um, buy the um, reading and writing materials that we use in the school, the blackboard, the chalk, the, the um, paper, the exercise books we use, the reading books we use. Uh, they've been very helpful. I think what the GLC is doing is only a start. It's only a start to... Um, they're the first group, you could say, that's actually bothered to go out and find out what sort of problems ethnic groups are facing. And they're trying their best to, to solve it or trying their best to do something about it. in the last year that um, Irish people and the GLC in a kind of reciprocal way started talking about Irish people as an ethnic minority um, and I think that part of the part of the reason that Irish people are now stronger in a political sense and more public and overt in a political sense is actually because of kind of learning some of the lessons that black people have like black people have done a lot of stuff around education and um, <clears throat> it was only 
they sort of through looking at education and looking at the kind of racist education their kids are getting in school. I think that the um, the, the book that they've just brought mm. out it is quite important because I think it it, it actually you know, it, it actually says it, it puts it down in print that it and there is an historical basis for, for about anti-Irish racism that. That before, I think people, if you if you mentioned it, people thought it's a, a chip on your shoulder. The reason why a lot of Irish people haven't co haven't actually been vocal or haven't come out is because is because of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and because of um, like the paranoia that exists and 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 how how well the British state have been able to inflict that on the Irish community. I think with the GLC, it, you are with some of the funded projects or the get-togethers, you actually have been allowed to come together um, and and be able to discuss those those politics with other Irish people. And as, as an Irish person living in London, when all you're getting is the British news, you, you do need to be able to talk to other Irish people about it. One of the things that goes from the GLC goes is either the reality of funding for some groups or the possibility of, of funding for other groups. And I do think that there's, there's so much that you can do without funding and that people can keep going for so long. But the actual spurt of getting something funded getting, and getting something funded by a public um, elected body kind of validates, validates what you're doing. What's happened with the GLC is it's, it's legitimised you being Irish. You don't have to be ashamed about who you are. Greenwich Dialorite is part of the London-wide scheme for Dialorites, which is financed by the GLC, who realised that there was really no transport for severely disabled people. It is a great lifesaver. It's a life enhancer. We have taken people who have never moved from their homes for years and years, who have all they can dare to do at first is to just go to be taken out in the vans and just look and see what's happening outside because they've been stuck in their homes. But what we really wanted to do, as people get with disabilities get courage, is for it to open up life for them so that they can go out and take their part in the mainstream of life, which they haven't done because they've been segregated for so long. You can go from one good borough to an absolutely appalling borough, where not only are the attitudes archaic, but the actual services are pretty rotten. So the one thing about the GLC, which is, you know, again, enormously in its favour, is that it, it evens out these uh, bad spots. My connection with the Charlton Skills Centre is that I'm vice chair. Uh, I got involved several years ago as a representative of Greenwich Association of the Disabled. Um, 
a lot of voluntary groups in Greenwich got together and decided that there should really be a skills centre which concentrated on those who were slipping through the net of other sort of skill centres, the, the disadvantaged people who'd been out long-term unemployed, ethnic minorities, women and disabled people. And I thought, what on earth's that? <laughs> so she told me what it was. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. I used to work on building sites. So um, I asked her what it was. I thought, yeah, right, then I'll try that. Well, I've always worked in office work, mainly in computers. And I went back to computers after a seven-year absence, and I couldn't get on with it again. So I just thought I'd try something different. And I saw this advertise, and it was either sheet metal or motor mechanics, because they was only running the two courses then. And I didn't fancy getting underneath the car. <laughs> so I thought I'd try this. I saw it in the local newspaper. I rang up for the motor mechanics. Obviously, it was full up. Everyone wants to be a motor mechanic nowadays. So I chose the sheet metal, because they do the welding and all that. And in a way, I'm glad I chose the sheet metal. Because it's a more detailed skill in the motor. Well, since I left school when I was 16, I only worked three and a half months. How old are you? 21. It's a long time. And unfortunately, the buildings aren't fully adapted yet. But it is going to be the first time that disabled people are going to be able to train alongside able-bodied people. Oh, it's very near to where I live. It's only a five-minute walk. Um, my mate come up with a newspaper one morning and he said, uh, there's a welding course and all this in the paper. And I goes, oh, that sounds all right. And he says, good money, it's 85 a week. <laughs> Left school four years ago. And in that time you had? About six months work. And so I want you to do a good, so neat well for me and follow those features that I have emphasised to you. So carry on. I'll watch you as you go ahead. See, with all the other type of training schemes about, only in short periods, you don't learn anything in six weeks. This is six months, you've got more time to learn. It gives you educational backup if, you're, if you want it, like maths, English. So it's there if you need it. Not many other places do that. They sort out the childminder. Um, they also pay the childminder's fees, so you haven't got to pay that out of your money. So take it very gently and just give it a touch up and bring that up. If you've got any problems, like your rent, if you've got to apply for rent rebate or anything to do with social security, Childminders, they sort it all out for you. One of the um, things that Charlton has actually set out to um, achieve is to um, also bring a better understanding between um, people from different social backgrounds, black people, white people, and clearly if you have such a, a mixture of people working together, obviously it's going to do a, a, a great deal for race relations. So I feel sure that um, the concept of Charlton is going to um, improve and I hope that it is actually copied by other um, uh, centres in, in um, London. Well, the people we are good to get on with. There's a lot of courses where in other places there ain't. So that's better really. Just what I like about this place, you, you all get on with one another. There's no body None of the blokes are higher than women. We're just mingling together. That's what I like about this sort of thing. If you've got a group which is all white, all male, middle class, 
doesn't have any access for people with disabilities or anybody that needs special help in any way, then I think what you're doing is ignoring the needs as well as the, um, the valuable contribution of a really large percentage of the community. Because, I mean, like, we live in a community that's made out of women and men and black people and white people. And uh, I think it's really quite an impoverished society if you only gear it to one particular type of people. And I think what the GLC are doing are actually positively discriminating for people that have in the past been seen as minority and their needs has been in the minority. And it's actually positively trying to bring that up. And obviously that's, you know, in the media, it's, it's, it's all part of the government and people in society seeing that as being very threatening. They've played on, on a specific fear in the community to, to downgrade the, the GLC, basically. I mean, they've basically boosted something very small into something very big, deliberately, because they know that has the most impact. I think it's one, less than 1% one of the whole budget is actually going to the lesbian gay community. Statistics are often quoted that 10% of the population are lesbian and gay, and I think the reality is that most of the population at some time in their lives have had feelings of closeness, affection, intimacy with someone of the same sex. And I was going to say that, that that centre that's been built and funded by GSC is one centre to cater for the social and support needs of the whole of London. So it's not a lot of money for one centre for the whole of London's gay population. And it's also attracting people from outside of London because it's the only thing that isn't just a social place. It has educational purposes. Even though there's been a lot of anti-press about what the GLC has done, it's made people so aware. And it's made individual um, lesbians, like myself, more aware of um, other visible people around who, who are actually sort of needing these sort of group-type arrangements to feel sort of, you know, they're not freaks and not um, estranged in the community. And the, the whole consciousness is making people share their, their, their lives and realise that they're not alone. So things like the Charter, which, they, which has been drawn up by the Gay Working Party, has now had this knock-on effect of actually other councils, other boroughs within London itself, such as Greenwich, such as Lewisham, Hackney, Lambeth, Islington, have taken the Charter up and are actually now lesbians and gay men are working with departments within the councils to actually look at what their policies are and what their practices are and get discriminatory policies changed. So much will be taken from us if, if the GLC is abolished, it's, it'll be a tremendous step back. It won't, won't kill the community. I mean, I'd like to emphasise that. It, nothing can kill what we have built. In the same way as that we will lose um, access to centres and places, the same will happen for black people, the same will happen for people with disabilities. And that it's like, I mean, there's been an understanding through the way in which the GLC has taken a principal stand about the end of all oppression, not just the end of this oppression or that oppression, but the end of all of them. And I, and I think there's like an awareness that it's going to hit everybody in the same way. So I mean, I think I would agree with Jeff, it's catastrophic. I think probably most people here are uh, aware of what the group's aims are, which are to campaign for an accountable police force uh, in London uh, to monitor the activities uh, For many of years, the police, there's been questionable policing in Lewisham. And there were a number of adverse policing um, events over the years, such as the New Cross fire, the Confay case, uh, the National Front March in Lewisham. Mission has been given today to the fascists, to the National Front, to march down the streets of Lewisham. I'm asking you, as the first citizen of the borough, on behalf of the Alcraft organisation, which has organised this peaceful demonstration, that you allow us the same rights to march along the streets of Lewisham on behalf of the overwhelming majority of the people of Lewisham who have no truck whatsoever with the National Front views. Thank you, Mr Mayor. All well, I can say to you is that if you care to make application to march on another day, every facility will be granted to you. This incident clearly demonstrates the difference between the type of policing a local community wanted and what it actually got. Commander Randall, I understand your point of view, I understand your position, the difficult position that you and your officers are in. This is it also a highlights the need for a permanent community-based organisation 
to press for a responsible, accountable police force. And it's for that reason that the GLC actually sponsors groups like the Lewisham Police Monitoring Group. What we've found over the years is that there's very little else or, or very few areas in which the through which the public can actually voice their criticism of the police. We, we, we have a complaint system which we at the Law Centre advise people to go through knowing that it's um, hardly adequate and there just isn't, there wouldn't be without the monitoring group, this forum for people to actually come and, and describe their experiences and find ways of dealing with them. The other big area of work that we're involved in is providing information no, to the community case. about no, general policing serious. issues. That in 1985, or the, the financial year 1985 to 1986, the proportion of Lewisham's police budget that will be paid by the ratepayers, that's known as the police precept, will be around £5 million. That's something like a third of the budget for the policing of the borough, and that's the contribution that the ratepayers make. It would be worthwhile to add that the ratepayers have absolutely no control over how that money is spent. Assembled in five minutes, it can quickly be dismantled for winter storage if necessary. Turning all your garden waste into good compost is as easy as turning the tumbler. It's a revolutionary way of going about composting. And the trouble with the traditional heap is that the pressure forces out the oxygen after a short space of time and the whole process slows down. But with the tumbler, um, with the aeration holes and the tumbling action, it allows more oxygen in and that keeps the whole composting process going. Made from recycled plastic barrels, it'll take the knocks and the bumps of life. It'll be one of your favourite garden tools for years. Available from the manufacturing co-op, Well, Blackwell Products is a concept for workers' cooperative. Its main aims and objectives are one to create employment in South Lake, East London. Um, a second aim is to promote the idea of recycling. I mean, this is a recycled barrel and it encourages people to recycle their own kitchen and garden waste. The car, there's several attractions to it. One is that the work is different. There's a variety of work. We rotate the sort of work that we do. So there's the, the manual physical work of, of getting the barrels ready, cutting the frames, spraying the barrels, as well as the, the marketing, advertising, that side of it as well. Um, plus the fact, of course, that as a co-op, you know, we have a responsibility in, in what we're doing. We share in the way the co-op progresses and we decide on a democratic basis which where the money's spent, what happens. Um, so it's having control over your own working life, really. For me, it's a lot better, it's a lot more satisfying. You know, working the other way in a straight management structure, it's frustrating because you're never asked your opinion, you're never taken into account when any decisions are made. You know, although what the job you do and what the other people do around you, you probably know better than what, what management do. Without the GLC's help, I'm not sure that we would have got as far as we have now. Well, they provided some of the initial funding for the uh, feasibility study, and we have a, an application for a loan with, with GLEB at the moment. And uh, we feel that within a short period, we'll be able to pay the loans back and we'll be a self-supporting business. At the moment, we have five in the park, five workers and perhaps by the end of next year there could be between 20 and 30 of us. And I think that's the reason why both the GLC and the Greater London Enterprise Board are particularly keen on helping to finance and start our co-op because it is job creating. The Lewisham Academy of Music um, is a community youth music programme 
um, where designs, especially for uh, young community people uh, who are basically haven't got much money, they come down here, they pay 60 pence a month, they can come and do saxophones, guitars, uh, bass, trumpets, African drumming, whatever. When you sign up for your membership, the good thing about it is that you're not, say, you're not told, right, now you're a member, go out and buy yourself a manuscript book and a pen, and come here, sit down, and learn these scales, or read music. You know, you're allowed to come here, feel the instrument, play with it, and at the same time, you're gonna learn. Again. One, two, Myself, I'm not on the dial now, I mean, I'm dead lucky. But when I was, this was the only place I could come to and find something to do, yeah? And inside myself, I felt like I was achieving something, yeah? It gave me hope I could get up every day with a smile on my face, not and I was actually going to go out there and do something, even though I knew there wasn't a prospect of getting a job, but at least I was doing something, yeah? I see kids like um, Sammy and Darren, them. Yeah, yeah. Right. They're nine, 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 ten. 11, 12, well, there was 10 when I first saw them. And they are the only 10-year-olds I know that, 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 that now they can call themselves more or less becoming accomplished musicians. And it's because of the little 60 pence that it cost them, because this place is being subsidised, that they can afford to do it, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do it. They'd be out throwing stones through somebody's window or something. I, I now have the privilege of calling myself a drummer. I've, been on, I've played on stages. Before I come to this place, I, I couldn't even... I didn't know how to hold a drumstick, and my little 60 pence a month got that for me. It's not the girl boy situation where, you know, girls get bullied by boys, you know. It's more like the boys getting bullied by the girls here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're all very equal here. I mean, we have the women's workshop, if you really are that, you know, shy. But you can actually go into any lesson you want to go into. There is no discrimination at all in this building. You know, there's nothing... There is not one single tense feeling about this building at all. Now, if this place closes down, there's going to be... How many, how many people we got in this gap? Yeah, how many members have we got inside 280. this 280. You're going to have, I mean, that's only a small proportion, but I'm just talking about the people that are coming inside it, yeah? You've got 280 people. You're going to leave them with absolutely nothing to do, no hope, absolutely nothing to do, because when they were coming inside it, at least they were achieving something, yeah? And you shut this place down and take that away from them, what the hell are they going to do? Move maybe straight away into that, that busy bit you were doing. The unfortunate thing is the GLC has become somewhat a, a, a dirty, dirty thing to say, I think. Um, the GLC must be abolished because uh, spending too much money on, on lost causes, small minority groups, etc. Um, that may seem, you know, uh, so to most people out there, but the fact of the matter is that the GLC is working for London. The GLC is working here, right? And it is. I mean, you can see it around you. Okay, saxophone. <laughs> Yeah. Junior drums, snare first, please. There is, there is an amazing amount of talent in this place. And because people are actually, the GLC is actually spending some money on it, it's being exploited. You know, it's coming out. Well, you're going to take it, the tape's rolling, right? right. Tape's rolling.
You abolish the GLC, this, this place will not exist, or it's just a waste. that one of the main reasons the government wants to abolish the GLC is because it is beginning to address itself effectively to the main issues of inequality in London. We are moving too fast and therefore we've got to be held down a bit, pushed down a bit. We, we, we are getting, uh, we are getting our status in other words, we are getting to see who we are and where we stand. And she doesn't like that. This is one idea of abolishing the GLC. The GLC represents people in the communities where they're at, what they want to do, making them aware of themselves and making them want to sort of um, find their own strengths. About 2,500 groups similar to the ones in this programme have been funded by the GLC in the last year. All of them are threatened by the abolition bill, which is now in its committee stage in the Lords. Do I think the GLC should be abolished? No. <laughs> no. Most definitely not. Well, I don't think the GLC should be abolished. I consider they're doing a very good job in many respects. No. Definitely not. If the GLC, if the GLC is abolished, well, England can no longer be called a democratic country. My answer would be no, the GLC shouldn't be abolished. Definitely not. No. no way. We haven't been consulted on the abolition of the GLC and I'm sure if we were, um, and the other 999 tenants on here would, would agree that they don't want the GLC to be abolished. No. What? Never! You are joking! No way! No way.